section, you can pop one in there and, and ask away. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Sam. Sam is Core That's very own AmeriCorps VISTA member. And Sam grew up in the woods of Maine. <coughs> Let me sign it correctly here, Maine. <laughs> I'm always confused which side of the chest it's on, Maine. And she, before, I mean, she just has such an extensive experience um, in the outdoors. She worked for Conservation Corps of Minnesota, CCM. She also worked with many different deaf camps, including Aspen Camp, as well as Camp Mark 7, and focusing on developing their outdoor programs. Sam recently graduated with a master's in outdoor leadership from Saybrook University and in partnership with Knowles, which is National Outdoor Leadership School. Sam recently joined the Core That team, I think now two years ago. Yeah, almost two years ago. Wow, time's going fast. And she's been focused on our outdoor education program as well as setting up the first conservation corps run by a deaf organization, which is exciting. She's really focused on inclusion and equality for deaf people in the outdoors. And so without further ado, I'll give it off to Sam Bragg here. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Everyone can see it? Okay, good. So welcome. I'm really excited um, to be here tonight. I just want to let you know that I am nervous because I really care about this topic. It's very important to me. And, you know, if I didn't care about it, I probably wouldn't be nervous tonight. So I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm a little nervous here. I also have a disclaimer that this is, um, this presentation tonight will be very raw, very authentic from my experience as a deaf female in the outdoors. Other people might have similar experiences or also have completely different journeys that they have experienced themselves. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge um, do a land acknowledgement and honor the indigenous people who are on the land here. And I want to just express my appreciation for the land and the people who have taken care of the land. Okay, so before I get started, I want to ask the community here, what does the outdoors mean to you? How do you define outdoors? Go ahead and just type your thoughts in the chat and what does it mean to you? And I'll go ahead and, and sign what I see in the chat. What do you Okay, Robbie, he's talking to you. Peace, um, powerful energy, yeah, space, tranquility. Refreshing, refreshing air being able to deal with difficult times, being in nature as much as possible, connecting to the wilderness as well as other people, feeling like I'm able to go back to my true self. Wow, these are really great comments. And I, I agree, there's no one perfect definition of the outdoors and I really cherish that. So thank you for sharing and putting everything into the chat there. next slide here. 
So this presentation, I'll be talking about my experience with Knowles. To give you a little bit of a background before I jump into it, I did a master's program with Saybrook University and with Knowles. There are two different institutions. I'll be focusing on Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School. It's a nonprofit organization that focuses on outdoor education and leadership and provides different courses. I'll be sharing with you the three different expeditions that I went on. The first one was a whitewater canoe trip. Then we did a canyoneering trip and then a backpacking trip. And I'll expand upon my experiences with each expedition. So that picture, every single time I see it, it just takes me back to that exact moment. That trip was where we were on whitewater canoe trip. We were doing 84 miles on the Green River. The Green River goes through the Desolation um, Wilderness and there's the Gray Canyons as well. So it's about a 14 day trip with rest days and built in as well. We switched over to the next river, which was the San Juan River. And it's about 84 miles. And it, there's an, it, we traveled all the way to the island of Mexican Hat. This was all based in Utah. The second expedition was canyoneering. And basically we backpacked and then we would rappel into canyons. And you can see in this photo, I'm rappelling into the canyon. This one was in the Robert Canyon. It's about 75 miles total. Um, there's a lot of slot canyons, narrow canyons where we'd have to rappel with our backpacks. Um, and traverse through the, the narrow canyon walls. Sometimes there'd be water, we'd be up waist into the, into walking waist deep in water. There's also a lot of technical equipment that we need to know for this trip as well, carrying our backpacks through along with rappelling. It was just really gorgeous. Uh, the oranges and the reds of the canyon were just so gorgeous. So next, the third expedition was a backpacking trip in the Tikhon Talkeetna Mountains in Alaska. We did mostly off trail traversing, but there was also some ATV trails. We went over mountain passes in the Chikutna and Monarch Pass. And now I wanna ask um, specifically the deaf and hard of pe hearing people who are here tonight, what does it mean for you to be deaf or hard of hearing in the outdoor space? What does that mean to you to be deaf in the outdoors? I wanna ask everyone in the audience because I reflect on that question all the time. Um, all the time myself. And so I'm curious to see what your reflections are if you don't mind typing them into the chat. So what does it mean to you to be deaf in the outdoors? Feeling the vibrations from nature. Yeah, I agree. Skills. Sometimes nervous at times, nerve wracking at times. Feeling stuck without interpreters all day. Yes, yes, we will definitely touch on that. Thank you for sharing your experience. And you guys can continue adding to the chat throughout the evening. Some people may not be familiar with the terms. Um, and so I want to introduce autism 
as a term that re relates to the view of the ability to hear being superior to, to the lack of being able to hear. Um, a lot of barriers, a lot of discrimination that happens within that room, in that space, and specifically in the outdoors, um, specifically in the outdoor recreation field as a deaf individual, all the barriers that are associated with that. So I'll be talking about autism bias within the outdoors. And I would just like to touch on this, mostly experiences that I've had myself. And I know that many of you are gonna have different experiences for yourselves as well. So we're talking about inclusive experiences and ex exactly how accessible those things are. And we have interpreters and I had two interpreters during my experience during all three expeditions that I went on. And that inclusive experience was still hampered because they had to be my mode of communication. So that was always a given. I always had to use an interpreter to get access to what was going on. If I didn't have an interpreter, I didn't get access. And that's just sort of the way it went. And that meant for me, I always had to use ASL. And I never really feel like I have that truly inclusive experience unless everyone is using ASL along with me. And that inclusive feeling is not exactly there when it's a hearing group and all communication is going through an interpreter. So understand for three of those trips that I made, I had the same interpreters the whole time and they were going from ASL to English, from English to ASL, and that was a continual experience. So obviously they were mentally exhausted by the end of the day. Their eyes and brains both were just filled with this information, plus they were doing the trek with us. So obviously when it would get dark at night and we'd have debriefings in the evening and it would get difficult to see the light sources were rather scarce, so they were exhausted trying to view and then trying to express. But it was nice to be in Alaska during the summer because there was really no sunset. The sun just stayed in the sky the whole time. So that light was wonderful. That was one of the pluses of going in Alaska and being able to view the discussion the whole time and not needing to worry about it getting dark in the evenings. So we had, I had a, you know, a struggle being fully involved with others because I had to use an interpreter for my communication. And the whole time, I'm kind of just following through this rough terrain and I'm trying to make sure that I stay safe and the interpreter has to stay safe as well. So I couldn't just participate as a student. So an interpreter would be chatting with me or discussing, you know, an experience. And that always meant that I had to wait till I arrived during a mealtime to have a discussion as quickly as possible, which was a different experience because hearing people would be communicating the whole trip. I also had to be a teacher, an advocate, and a student, a graduate student during this trip while my classmates were maybe just experiencing it as a student where I was trying to advocate for deaf, the deaf community. I was trying to teach ASL and experience ASL, and I was trying to balance all these things, which was mentally exhausting for me as well. So my experience was not necessarily identical to everyone else's. This picture is from Repelling, and I really just, I don't know, that memory to me is wonderful. I'd say it was about 80 feet that I repelled that day is pretty phenomenal. I'd like to comment on what this paragraph says as well, and just take a look over it real quick. I hope you guys had an opportunity to read this. And this is a short paragraph that I'm gonna sign through. And it's a teacher actually said this to me. They said, uh, I have a question. Is there a part of being deaf that is easy? Because the teacher told me they imagine that so much of the time they only see a small fraction of that experience and then it's challenging to be deaf. So what's a beautiful part of deafness? What is it beautiful in any way? And to be honest with you guys, the attention behind this was not negative. It was just curiosity, I believe, but it was so ignorant for sure because I, that teacher had obviously not interacted with the deaf person before. 
when I think about that paragraph, it really just puts me on edge and it really impacts me because is that how hearing individuals see the deaf community? Do we actually have to take the time to explain every little beautiful thing about what it means to be deaf? There's so many beautiful things about being deaf. We don't even have time to go into depth here because of the sheer number. We have the ASL, we have the culture, we have the value. Everything that is included in my identity is beautiful. Everything about the concept of deafness is gorgeous. And that question really just impacted me and led me to this pattern of thinking for what it means to be deaf in the outdoors. And honestly, ASL is a language and it's gorgeous. And that's a benefit that we receive. And it's a benefit that we gain from ASL because of its visual nature and the way that it is so easy on the eyes. Okay, so I wanna tell you guys a story that I experienced and actually a few stories that I experienced during these three trekking trips. So specifically, this was my canoeing trip in Utah. And this was part of the San Juan River that I got to go on. And I was designated as the, the designated leader for that day, which meant I was the leader for that, that day. And it was my job to figure out everything relating to the trek, to the route, to the mileage, how many miles we were going to go. That was all my responsibility, the activities and how to include everyone and what that was going to look like for the day, the curriculum, the plans, everything was on my shoulders. And that was my role. And that was what I had to be responsible for, for those 24 hours. So I remember looking back on that day, that was the last day that I could be the designated leader. And that was the last day for that trip that I could just have that role for the canoeing specifically. So I really wanted to do something that was going to be impactful for people that was going to be different and challenging. So I took into consideration this new idea and I thought, why not add a challenge? And I gave them the option to either wear earplugs all day while they were canoeing or, and just to see what it would feel like, just to see what, to stimulate the experience of being deaf. And whether that was, you know, fully deaf or whatever, this would just be a challenge for them. The other option they could have was to wear a blindfold. And remember, most of these individuals were, were hearing, in fact, all of them were, and so they seemed very nervous about participating in this, while, in this way. One of the instructors, after I mentioned these options, noticed that everyone felt a little on edge. So she volunteered, she said, okay, I'll do it. I'll try this out. So she got in her canoe and she got close to the rapids and she was go, going by the camp in her, in her canoe. And it was really sweet because that this was just a little rapid, but she had a blindfold on and she was canoeing right up to the rapid. So immediately, one other teacher who was standing on land started yelling commands to her, hey, you need to go left, you need to go a little bit right. Okay, you know, go, go ahead and go straight. And they were yelling to protect her from, you know, running into things. And she was using her ears, but not relying on any sense of vision to direct her path. And everybody else was observing her. And it was really a powerful moment because she was willing to try this experience. She was, she was willing to discount one of her senses through this experience, go ahead and take that out of the equation. And she was trusting her other senses and the guidance of her peers. And the students who were there were all just sort of mesmerized by this experience. They were like, wow, could you just see that? Do you see what happened? I've never seen something like that before. And that was a powerful experience. experience. And it really felt as though after that, the students were more collaborative, perhaps. They were more willing to do this thing because the teacher had gone before them. So most of them did the earplugs. Some of them even did the blindfolds as well. And some of them did both together, which was pretty impressive. But they did that. And that was an experience that switched on and off throughout the day. And that experience traveling with these different, you know, limited senses helped heighten other senses that they still had access to. And I really felt like I had a connection to that group after that experience. For three weeks previously, I'd been, you know, trekking with them and I felt sort of a disconnect and I was trying to develop that. But after that day of me being the designated leader and establishing that activity, there was so much more connection between everyone. It was really a wonderful experience. And we tried these things and we learned from different ex perspectives and experiences. And that really benefited the group as a whole. So this is another picture that's really close to my heart. This is really my favorite part of all three 
trips was the map discussions. I love reading maps. I love trying to figure out what's going to be next, how many miles we're going to go. I love this planning part. And when I look back, that was always my favorite part about all these treks because every time, every day in the morning, we would get together as a group and we would plan where we were going to go and how we were going to get there. And that group discussion was just wonderful. At the beginning of the first trip and the second expedition as well, when I went canoeing and then canyoning as well, um, really all the individuals involved were talking and pointing at the map and trying to discuss their ideas. And so much was going on that the interpreter couldn't necessarily keep track of everything. If I looked at the interpreter to try to figure out what the communication was, I would miss them pointing at the map and I would overlook a part of the plan. So sometimes the elevation or the mileage was information that I would miss. And I was trying to figure out what was going on because it was going too quickly. So hearing people would typically just speak and look at the map and point at the same time, but deaf people function differently. We point and when we look at one another and then we pause the pointing and we ensure that communication can occur. And then again, we'll look at the map and then we'll point and we take sort of a different perspective on that system and it functions well for deaf individuals, but this was not very effective within, you know, a hearing and deaf sort of collision in a group. We have different communication styles. So the speaking and pointing at the same time was always a struggle for me because I was trying to look at the interpreter and I would miss information. And I realized now from that experience and on, when I went on the canyoning trip for my other trip, I went ahead and signed an ASL and tried to participate. And individuals are still learning ASL, but I tried to teach them some vocab and that basic vocab about mileage, about how many miles we were gonna go, about whether south, north, east or west, those directions, and then elevation and what that would look like. Those basic signs were taught within the whole group. And then that became sort of our tradition so that every morning when we would have these map discussions, we would sign an ASL the whole time. And I noticed that those instructors from NOLS were willing to do this. And when they were, the students were also willing. And this helped aid the concentration. And no one really missed anything because everybody was having this more visual 3D planning form and description. So we were describing the valleys and the wadi and the water and the terrain. And this helped make everything in the communication more effective. And this connected the map to real life instead of just making it a map and spoken discussion. So I really say ASL was a wonderful opportunity um, just as a language in a, in a form of language within this whole trip. And that was really special and beneficial for me and beneficial for other people in the group as well. So back to the canoeing trip again. One instructor approached me after the experience of, you know, discussing becoming in involved with the group. And that comparison was really powerful. And that was special because there was the insurement that a deaf person would become involved in this, this program. And that instructor really said it, it changed her perspective and her understanding of how this trip would work. That canoeing trip, when we were close to the rapids, we would often use scouting, which was just an individual looking over. And we use this, uh, this acronym called WORMS, which stands for Water, Obstacles, Route, Markers, and Safety. So just as an, an abbreviation for WORMS. And that was what we used during the trip. The first few times we would stop and scout. And oftentimes the teacher would try to scout and discuss, discuss during the, the trip over the rapids. And that became sort of dangerous. And that was just sort of us following through the scouting and standing on the boat and then trying to look ahead and see where maybe it got rough and avoid those areas. And then speaking through how we were going to avoid those rough spots on the boat during the trip. So we felt that that was really challenging and sometimes the interpreter was way behind or way ahead of me. So it was really difficult to catch up to them in time to let that scouting communication take place and it could be interpreted so I could understand. So many situations were not uncomfortable, were not comfortable and they were also not successful. So when it came to scouting, we realized it was easier to do that first on land. So I could see the interpreter, so I had full access, and I would understand everything that was going on as far as communication, instead of trying to keep up with the interpreter to make sure I had a partner. So when we decided to move this discussion on 
land, we would talk through this WORMS acronym before we went ahead on the rapids, we realized that it was decently effective. And then we decided to try something different. Why not try this scouting on the boats and discuss this WORMS method, but do it through sign language? Why not go ahead and avoid rocks or avoid difficult places in the water, but sign through that instead of trying to yell back and forth as communication? So the instructor thought this was an interesting idea. So it, it was really a loud area also where the water ran over the rapids and it seemed to be difficult to yell over that sound sometimes. So we decided to see if ASL would be effective. We could also understand exactly what was being discussed because it was more of a 3D language and we would avoid you know, being dumped into the water or hitting something and being overturned. So ASL caused fewer errors, fewer injuries, and it seemed really effective in that setting. And everyone paid more attention because everybody was waiting for a scout to sign to them. And again, with a 3D language, if you're looking at the river, you can see many rocks. These can be described easily in ASL, whereas an English sentence might require, you know, there's a rock to the left, you're far left, you know, you're close left. And, and ASL is just very descriptive and it allows you to describe exactly what that rock looks like. Maybe it's pointed or maybe it's rounded. And these descriptions in ASL are so much more straightforward versus an English sentence or two or three. Even gestures at this point are extremely effective and that's gonna lessen errors and that's gonna make sure that everybody's safe during the trip. Really, I have really, made, really quite a few favorite stories regarding these treks, but one of my very favorite stories occurred in Alaska during my backpacking trip. And honestly, I went with classmates and we all wanted to challenge ourselves to a common goal to have an ASL trek day. And it meant that everybody had to practice ASL before that specific day and everybody had to use ASL for that whole day. So for one or two weeks, we practiced. And a few days before the trek actually ended, we went ahead and implemented that all day ASL trekking day. And we signed the whole day. And when we finally arrived at that day, we actually did. We, we read the map and we did it just like we would normally. We discussed, we had conversations, we had meal times, And out of all the other days we were in Alaska, we were truly we were actually met up with another NOLS team during that day. And that individual there knew our teacher. They knew each other and that man was speaking and trying to comment and our teacher was kind of stuck for a minute because today was our ASL day. So they informed the gentleman that they couldn't speak. So they gestured and they finger spelled and they went through the alphabet and tried to figure things out and that wasn't working. So they took a piece of paper and they started writing down comments and that was how they communicated with this other leader that they ran into. Individuals from the other group were kind of looking at us wacky, but they realized that they were reading and it was a, when they read through our notes that it was ASL day and that was our form of communication for those 24 hours. So the teacher truly persevered through this experience. So she that that teacher stuck with ASL during our ASL day and she they didn't revert back to what language was comfortable for them, even when they met with individuals that they knew out in the field. So it's possible, it is possible to stick with that language form. So really that, when it comes to our group, it, it, a willingness to learn and a willingness to work and it is important and it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of thought to figure out how to communicate with people, whether that's through gesture and it takes a lot of, you know, maybe being uncomfortable and a lot of maybe stubbornness in a way to continue with the communication mode and a lot of repetition. And that is how we can share our perspective. And that's how we can share our view through this attitude. There's so many benefits that you can take away from this experience. Simple gestures are so important to language. Even simple gestures that you can be open to, that, that concept, and maybe some signs, just some basic signs to communicate, those really will help deaf individuals feel more included. They really were able to notice my experience on that day 
and seeing all the access that I am able to have while signing and how I'm able to thrive. And, you know, they, because ASL was new to them, they weren't able to have a full entire conversation with everyone in the group. And I think they recognized that um, kind of like they were in my shoes that I had been experiencing every day on each expedition, trying to communicate and not always having full access to communication and having to miss things. And, and now the tables were turned and that they were missing a lot and they had to struggle to communicate. And so they were able to see what that was like. Was it 100% exactly the same experience? No, but I think they were able to get an idea of my experience. I think it takes time to for hearing people to learn, but they may be going out of their comfort zone, but they're able to. And we as deaf people are constantly pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone every day of our lives. And so having that challenge for them was a similar challenge that I had for myself. One instructor did come up after me after all of our expeditions and made the comment, I would like to recognize all the extra work that I saw you taking on during the expeditions, making sure that you were involved in this program with the Knowles program. And really being able to be involved, all that work to be involved in a program that has an autism bias naturally built into the program. And I was really just impressed and kind of shocked that they were able to see that. And I hope that that's able to extend past us and other people are able to be more aware in the future. I'm sure you're already aware of the term deaf gain, but I wanna add my experience with deaf gain. Deaf gain is a shift uh, of view on deaf people. Instead of looking at deaf people as hearing loss, we're looking at deaf people as a very, a, a community that's able to give a lot back and enriching language and culture and able to offer a lot um, to the hearing world as well. And so something that that is a gain, that's something we have to give. I want to put that out there. There's many different ways deaf gain affected my expedition with our map reading, being able to describe things in 3D, being able to point out like the macro to the micro and the, the mountains and seeing the ridges and all that in ASL. Whereas when you're speaking English, it's very linear. And so it misses that 3D element. And I think that is a big game that ASL had to offer. Um, when we were discussing our worms around the rapids, you know, the water was really loud. And so it was hard oftentimes hearing people are having to yell or repeat. Whereas here we were, here I was able to sign. And, and when we all were able to sign, we had much clearer communication amongst the group. So I think once again, my, being deaf had a lot to offer in these situations. And also in repelling, when we're going down the canyon wall and there's people on top of the canyon wall and there's people on the bottom and sometimes it's very windy and loud, we're far away from each other, having the ability to sign like, hey, I'm ready, ready to belay, ready. Those, those situations add to the safety of the overall situation and reduce the risk that could happen. And I think I, that was apparent in many different situations throughout the expeditions. There is also um, many different like cultural tips as well as just like having my classmates be more open to gesturing and making mistakes and being okay with that. And I think that was a gain for them as well. And also, you know, recognizing that they're able to be an advocate for me as well. Like I am a student, I am a person, I am part of this, this experience instead of having to focus on all my different roles. And so they, you know, being able to take on some gesturing for different situations. For example, there's one story in the canyon 
in Utah, when we were walking through, traversing through the slot canyons and we we're going back up to the top, we had to do some scrambling and a lot of technical skill um, that we had to use going up the canyon walls. We had many people in our group. And so in order to get out, we had to go one, one person at a time so that we wouldn't injure the people below us. And so at my turn, I had an instructor trying to explain to me when I'm at on the wall of like where um, we had our belay system ready, like where I could move and it would be safe without falling. And we're trying to figure out that communication. But that instructor was kind of dependent on the interpreter. But because the interpreter can't be in that physical space with me, it was too small. There's only one person able to fit at a time. I had one interpreter behind me and one interpreter in front of me. But then there I was having to like either look way up ahead of me or down below me at the interpreter, which really increased the risk in that situation. And so I think if the instructor had been able to gesture or had known a little bit of sign, then it would have been a lot safer and a lot more easy situation. And nothing happened, but I did feel like we were putting ourselves at risk, me and myself and the interpreters as well, in trying to communicate via the interpreters. Whereas if the instructor was able to just communicate directly with me and have more gestures, I think that would have been a safer situation for everyone. In closing, I wanna return to my comment about what does it mean to be deaf in the outdoors? And I know that everyone has their own personal journeys. I think, you know, I didn't really realize like thinking about my deafness in every single different situation. You know, oftentimes I had experiences where I was in completely signing environments in the outdoors up until this point. And I really, it is a beautiful thing. And I see things so differently as a deaf person in the outdoor space, in the outdoor world. And I think a lot of people do experience the same thing, but I think as a deaf person, I see things in more detail. I'm more, uh, I'm observing more intensely in most situations and that's beautiful. And again, I never thought about that experience that being my experience until that instructor asked me that question. I think, you know, my experience has always had been with deaf and hard of hearing people signing, backpacking, crossing the river. Like we always were signing and I had full access. We were explaining things or I'd go rock climbing with friends. We'd always be signing or even gesturing. But then when I joined this experience and had I was the only deaf person in a group of hearing people and having to explain my experience and having to navigate that, there was a lot of reflection, a lot of self-reflection that I, I did. The other thing I think that I had was having a very hands-on experience as well as very visual. I know that many deaf and hard of hearing people see themselves as visual learners. And that was another gain for myself as well. And I think the biggest reward for myself was being able to finally just be myself, not having to explain who I am and my culture and what does it mean to be deaf to all these people, but just to be me. So to wrap up, I want to invite all of you deaf and hard of hearing people to take that leap, get involved in the outdoors help break barriers for other people within the outdoors and make the outdoors a more inclusive space for everyone. And I invite the hearing people at this presentation to welcome deaf individuals into the outdoors, to recognize that we bring a different lens and a different perspective when looking at the outdoors as deaf people. And that's all I have for you tonight. So I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Sam. I always enjoy your stories and your experience. And I've seen that there's a lot of people have put comments in the chat and I've already kind of recorded them and wrote them down for us. So I noticed there are some questions. 
as a deaf person who are very impactful for your experience. So here's one. I wonder if on the backpacking trip or the canoeing trip now with COVID, how would you be able to handle those experiences in every state having different rules? Um, so I personally don't provide backpacking classes or canoeing classes at this time, but I think, so I can't speak to that, but I think, you know, have, doing your research, figuring out the numbers, the max number of people who'd be able to join on a trip safely, um, researching the local, you know, state parks or different parks maybe are closed in that region and looking ahead to what the, the, the state will be allowing you to do. Um, so I just think, you know, making sure you do your research ahead of time. Hmm, yeah, good advice. Um, so when you're joining other programs, who provided the interpreters, the school or the, the university or program, did they provide the interpreters? That's the first question. And then the second question also relating to the interpreters, did they pay for their own trip or, you know, how did that work out? And also how did the interpreters, did they enjoy the trip? Did they have a good time? So my situation was a little bit different. Um, there's a program with both my university and NOLS, and they were both sort of willing to participate and pay for part of that. And both of those parts came together and just sort of made a whole. And I had no responsibility for the cost, but they, with the contributions they both made, it worked out. And what was the second question? Um, so that was more about the payment, but then was it challenging to find interpreters who were able to fit with the, the trip? So the interpreters themselves, for those situations, the interpreter didn't have to pay for anything, um, just to clear that one up. They, they were provided with opportunity and they were paid for their interpreting work that they did during that scenario. And the flight was included as well, you know, that as far as travel was. For the, the third one you mentioned, it is challenging to find an interpreter who's willing to do those jobs outside. It, it, it takes experience, it takes understanding of the outdoors, and it takes you know, an understanding because outdoor interpreting is different. The boundaries are different and they're more flexible and you have to be ready to interpret 24 seven. And it's the same way, you know, whether you're on trekking or in camp and during, you know, interpreting for socializing and meal times, there's a lot of boundaries that are maybe pushed in that type of situation. So the interpreter has to be comfortable with rough terrain, with, you know, putting themselves in risk. It's really tough to find someone who's willing to do all of that for you. Hmm. Yeah. So now here's another person's comment. At the beginning of your presentation, often you were having to wait all day to be able to have that access to communication. And so I'm wondering, did the leader, are they able to do anything to provide a more smooth communication access on the trip? There's maybe one thing that I can think of when it comes to route planning and inclusion, when maybe there's some flat terrain there, there's, it's just sort of challenging if, if it's not, you know, flat, but in Alaska, I would say there was a lot of trekking through um, maybe like ATV areas. And I took always the opportunity when there was flat terrain to chat with others, but most of it was pretty rough terrain. So you had to pay attention and you had to stay on task with that. But whenever there was flat and wide terrain that allowed two people to walk side by side and there was more chatting that could go on. There were also more breaks. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but deaf people often tend to take signing breaks. They come together during their trekking trip. They'll trek hard and they'll chat hard on their breaks. When they arrive to where they're, they're supposed to be, that's when they take their break to talk. But when they're trekking, they don't typically have a lot of communication and that's their system typically. They hold on to those comments until they finally have an opportunity to communicate at a rest point. So they typically take more breaks than perhaps hearing individuals. So those are two comments I would say as far as communication. So kind of related to the tips here, what are two or three things that you suggest hearing people should know about if they want to create a more welcoming space 
specifically for deaf and hard of hearing individuals? What should they do? Hmm. Um, I feel like there are two or three tips, man, that's, that's pretty, it's only a few tips there. Uh, yeah. Let's see. First, I would say acknowledge that it's not going to be easy for the deaf individual. Same, same way it's not going to be easy for a hearing individual. It's not going to always be easy. They might be frustrated easily. They might feel like there are barriers. They might need some space. You need to allow people to have space for them and for the, themselves as an individual. That's kind of my first comment. And secondly, learn some sign. Even if it's just basic, just some general sign for that communication barrier to be lessened and put that responsibility a little less on the deaf individual. So just learning some gestures and some signs so that they don't have to explain everything over and over again through an interpreter. And that's going to help your communication with a deaf individual. And that's going to, yeah, that, that's probably the best. So did you find that some students were very interested to learn ASL or did you feel like some of them were less interested? Does this apply to the instructors as well? The students were very motivated, I would say. I would say there were maybe two that really, really picked it up. Uh, it was a small group. I'd say maybe there were four in total of the students. So two out of the four were sort of just really motivated. All of them did learn some, but two of them seemed really just fluent in a short amount of time. And the other two were willing to write or to gesture. And the instructors, I would say, I had many different instructor, instructors during that um, those three trips. So they changed quite often. And some of them were motivated and interested in ASL. And some of them now to this day still contact me and are trying to take ASL classes and learn the sign. And that's exciting to see that process continue in their lives. But some other instructors were a little bit more uncomfortable. They were nervous. They were afraid to make mistakes. And again, the, another tip, don't be nervous. Go ahead and try. Go ahead and gesture. Put yourself out there. Because deaf people see the mistakes and we're used to it. We don't mind. We don't mind it. Yeah, you're right. And we're all human, right? So exactly. we're allowed to make mistakes. Yeah, it's a little more fun if you're be able to be flexible like that. And you can laugh about it later. Right, right. Yeah. So another person is asking, do you have any advice or tips for interpreters who are going out and adventuring? What do you wish that they knew? Hmm, I would say on those three trips, having an interpreter who is experienced with those different terrains. So like for wa white water, ra water rafting, those interpreters did not have any experience with white water rafting when they came on my trip. So that made it more difficult for them to focus on interpreting because they didn't have the technical experience that was required for outdoor interpreting. So having those specific technical skills for the terrain is wonderful. If you can have training beforehand or get experience in different fields, that'd be wonderful. Go ahead and pick up some workshops or, you know, try to gain knowledge in those areas. So for example, with a whitewater rafting trip, the interpreter had to learn on the job as well. They were interpreting, but they were also learning as I learned. And that made it difficult because they had to learn how to tie knots, which was really challenging. And so they're trying to describe it to me and they're trying to make sure that they understand it. And they're trying to explain that to me and listen to the teacher. So there's a lot of avenues of learning you can look at and a lot of specific things that you can excel in. And so whitewater rafting is only one of them, but my backpacking trip is another example. So there are a lot of areas where you can excel. So I want to follow up with that question. Do you think, I mean, I know it's nice to have an interpreter who had experience in like whitewater rafting or canoeing or, or the many other needs that they need but you know also like interpreters aren't robots they're not gonna know everything right and so personally as a deaf individual do you feel that it's best for you to pick the interpreter that you feel matches you and that you're most comfortable with or to let the organization or the agency f pick the interpreter I think it's important that deaf individuals are always 
involved in the interpreter choosing process. You know, if you're going to be outdoors for a month with those individuals and you're stuck in the field with someone that you're not really close with, that's that's not going to be ideal that if their skills are not matched to what you need. But that was a good question. Yeah, and we have some other questions here. One person saying, I really appreciated your experience and especially with interpreters who are outdoor interpreters and inventor interpreters. And I've had similar experiences with the boundaries and figuring those out. So how do you suggest working with an interpreter and suggesting like maybe needing alone time or figuring out a more respective way to establish those boundaries? Um, as well as sometimes feeling awkward when those boundaries are crossed and needing private space. So obviously establishing clear communication is really important. And I was lucky to know most of the interpreters that I worked with. So I felt comfortable and I could be honest with them and say, hey, you know, I need some time alone. I just need to trek by myself or just think. And you need a communication system that's comfortable like that. If you have a code system or something just simple that you can use to communicate, like, like your code for, you know, like code word for pig might mean, you know, I just need some time alone. And that all you have to do is sign that and you can, you know, get your alone space. And maybe having a code like that is useful. And I would say that letting the interpreter know, you know, in that state is better because I can't continue to be with this interpreter all the time. I need space where I can go on my own. I really think open communication is ideal. And that's that's the best way to function with an interpreter if you're you know working with them for a month you have to be comfortable you have to be comfortable it's funny you mentioned um about having a code system because i think with core that with our sign here core that is kind of a similar concept um we work together as a team and we have to be able to connect and communicate with each other and and having that specific, you know, just like with military or any kind of core, we also have that system set up in within our core. And so being able to have that open communication as well is really important. And I know we're running out of time here, but we do have some great questions still. And so um, if you have to drop off, that's fine. I want you to know that this will be recorded. We will be uploading it to YouTube at some point. And so you'll be able to um, join back and see, you know, the end of this. And I know this has been a really amazing presentation. I really appreciated Sam sharing her raw and, and opening up about her experience with Knowles. So here's another question. What do you think is the best way to get enough deaf students who are interested and motivated to take a Knowles course? So we don't need interpreters. It would be a completely immersive deaf expedition. That's challenging right now, especially with funding. When out in the field without technology, it's pretty difficult to establish a group like that. But if you have a clear description of what the trip's going to be and what it's going to look like, if you can go into a deaf school and discuss and explain what they might experience there and what sort of benefits they might get from a trip like this, I would say you might be able to get some individuals interested to join this group and go out on the field. But in general, you know, if you're able to sign and show them that this might be effective, it might be interesting and it might be something to look into and establish. You could show them videos or, or pictures of your experiences on a trip, and maybe this type of you know discussion about experience is going to really draw their interest and make them willing to do something like this. And if you let them know that individuals in that group are going to be deaf and hard of hearing, they're going to have more motivation to join in for that trip because some of them know that feeling of isolation in a mainstream program or something like that. So the idea of being able to participate with hard of hearing and deaf individuals and create a system there and a community there would be exciting. So I'm wondering if Knowles has deaf instructors that they would be able to pull for a program like that. So that everyone would be able to have a, a deaf crew go off on an expedition. I wonder if Knowles has deaf instructors. That'd be definitely something cool to consider. And it would be really a cool way to establish some role models. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, so another question is, do you know any outdoor providers like Knowles or Outward Bound um, or others that provide technical training for interpreters specifically? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, the only thing that I know that we do encourage is WFA, which sometimes will offer training or certification for interpreters. And signers or the deaf of hard of hearing who are interested in certifying for these skills. That's that one for sure, WFA. But otherwise, specifically for interpreters, that's something that would be wonderful to have. I'm sure we, we might have that somewhere. Um, we have, you know, a focus for medical field, for a focus for, you know, the legal field and outdoor interpreting should have one too, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. So now more popping up more questions related to Knowles. And so now they're asking, or I want to add a personal question here. What's the difference of um, having Knowles instructors who are hearing, but no ASL compared to a deaf instructor? What do you think the difference would be? Or I guess, what, how would that impact your experience? If you're having, you know, it's the same program, same design of a program, but with those instructors. The services that you're going to receive from a deaf or hearing individual all has to do with communication access. If a deaf individual is there, they're going to have that cultural experience. They're going to be, uh, you know, having that, that worldview and that understanding that stems from deafness what it's like to be deaf or hard of hearing so just in general that experience is going to have um, a lot more to connect with as far as experiencing autism they're going to understand what that has to what that involves and if there's an issue they can communicate that with you and they have that shared experience and again you can have a deaf or a hearing team that either team is wonderful and you could have them both together and that would be functional as well. I just think having a deaf individual on the team would be wonderful just because of those shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, I think we are coming to our last question. Well, some people now are asking, do you know of any um, deaf instructors in the Pacific Northwest area? Um, so I don't know if you specifically know, but if, if you did, it'd be nice to find more deaf instructors out there. And I know we're running out of time now. I'm just, I can't impress this enough, but we are so lucky to have you within our core of that team with your perspectives, with your experience. I know myself, you know, I enjoy being in the outdoors. I have a lot of experience there, but I haven't done a master's program like you have done. And so having that perspective is really enriching and we really appreciate you having this presentation, this webinar. I know it can be quite nerve wracking to have everyone watching you give a presentation, but we really wanna thank you for doing that and sharing your story and providing a different perspective, I think is so valuable. And, you know, having that deaf perspective in the outdoors and navigating expeditions like that is just amazing. Definitely. So if you have any advice or any last words before we close. Uh, I think for all of the deaf and hard of hearing individuals who are watching, encourage your youth to get out to break barriers. And this can be in different fields. This can be, you know, like anywhere because in the outdoor world, there's a lot of barriers. There's, you know, the concept of hiring an interpreter who's whether certified or not certified. And those are things that you have to sort of function and work through and advocate yourself for. But deaf people outdoors is our goal. And that's really a way that we can get more people to participate together. And that would be wonderful if we could form something like that. So just keep pressing onwards when it comes to this. Be stubborn so that we can make more and more people be aware of this and break down more boundaries and come together in the out of doors. Awesome, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, and I know some people are wondering about how you can contact us. Um, so you can go ahead and contact us at courses at 
coreofthat.org to share any feedbacks, or you can ask any more questions as well, um, specifically of Sam and having what and, and her perspective and her experience. Um, if you're wondering how you would like to, how you can support us, you're welcome to make a donation on our website. We have a donation button. We're a nonprofit organization, all volunteer run, and all the, the funding that is donated to us goes directly to our programming. Also, please follow us on social media. We have Instagram. Our handle is core that. And on Facebook, it's core that as well. And you can check us out there. And again, you're always welcome to email us at courses at corethat.org. Also, you can contact us at info at corethat.org too. So if whichever is easier for you to remember, info or courses, both work. Um, also, I want to let you know that after we close this session tonight, we will be uploading this video, the recording, as well as the captions to YouTube. So if you have any friends or family members who are interested, they can check it out there. Again, thank you to everyone to joining us tonight, especially giving up watching the Super Bowl to watch Sam's presentation. Honestly, I think this is much better. But thank you again. Have a wonderful night. Thank Have you. a wonderful night, guys. Thank you.